Mm -hmm. uh, you were certainly, as time went by in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone was just coming out of conflict when we got there. And there was a peace, UN peacekeeping force in Sierra Leone of 15,000 plus. So you had a lot of security around. We had court security. One of the pictures in there when I showed us all standing outside, several of those people standing in that group were close protection officers. The prosecutor traveled with a close protection officer wherever he or she went in Sierra Leone. The judges did as well. Um, I never felt particularly unsafe, but you just stayed aware of your surroundings. And the court was always on the lookout and would inform us of any particular threats, and we would avoid those. Yeah. Brian. Were the courts operational in Sierra Leone when you arrived? Yes. If so, what was the negotiation like? in determining the scope of the, of the power of the, of the court? That the local courts were not involved in that. The uh, very, very short background on that. The, um, the Sierra Leone government, unlike Yugoslavia and Rwanda, came to the UN and said, we would like to see a court established in our country, but we certainly don't have the means to try these people or the ability. And so that's when I say the U court was set up between the United Nations and the government of Sierra Leone. But at that point, the Security Council, a report was done for the Security Council, and that's where the statute came from. And so at that point in time, the statute was created by negotiations, but mainly within the Security Council and the United Nations. The agreement was signed between the government of Sierra Leone and the United Nations. And then, the, and then the Parliament of Sierra Leone ratified that agreement. So, uh, so we were completely independent of the government of Sierra Leone. We were an international tribunal, just as the other tribunals. And the government of Sierra Leone, by treaty, was our court had a position above all of the Sierra Leone courts. And they were, and they were subordinate to us if we needed assistance, or whatever the case may be, the government of Sierra Leone was obligated to enforce any orders out of our court. Uh, I think the question was over here. Um, you mentioned a lot about how there is a generation of children, and like, what are you doing now, or like, is there still any awareness of it coming back in this year with you, or? Well, certainly after the conflict, there were many, many, there were several demobilization, Disarming, demobilization, and reintegration programs, DDRs. I think I've got the three right. But there were a number of programs in and around Sierra Leone to try and reintegrate child soldiers back into the economy. Back into, there were job training programs. There were lots of programs like that to try and teach them skills. Uh, you know, those programs were marginally successful. Eventually, they were just absorbed back into society. Eventually they grew up, and they were just in many ways absorbed back into society. There are still NGOs there trying to provide some amount of assistance. But, uh, but there's not, you know, I showed you those pictures, the, the one burned out building, the one, you know, in the front. Most of the country still looks just like that, where they had hard buildings. Most of them are still just like that and destroyed because there's no means to rebuild the country. The country is slowly rebuilding. There's still aid coming into the country, not like the level it was. But most of them have been absorbed back into society. Yeah. Okay, let's take a couple more. This one next and over here. Uh, do, do you think you will, that you will ever get the death penalty? No, I don't think that the international tribunals will ever adopt the death penalty. Okay. I don't. That's the short answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had one over here. Well, it's not a matter of knowing what I know. Knowing, I mean, you know, the work was rewarding. You felt like you were doing something. You felt like you were making a difference. So it, it's not so much that I would still feel that way going back, but uh, but it was time for me to come home. <laughs> and, 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 you know that's a long time over, and uh, I 
And I stayed to the end because I wanted to see the trial through, and that was a number of years longer than we ever expected those trials to last. But, uh, you know, I, don't, I feel like I, I, I don't know that I would have an interest in doing that. <laughs> never say never, but I don't know that I would have an interest. I think I, there was... I want to say that I think it's interesting that he chose for his next job the head of the Robert H. Jackson. <laughs> well, that's true. I think he's really finding a way to continue the mission. That's right. Without, yeah. That's, let's go with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you had this uh, enforcement subpoena against somebody like Neil Campbell, how would you do it? Well, you see, that's, that's one of the differences between our court and the other international tribunals. Countries are asked to enforce our subpoenas. Nigeria, of course, did not. They did not support our arrest warrant. Uh, but, um, but countries, uh, we did not have an enforcement authority by our court for the UN Security Council, generally speaking. I mean, our orders, Rwanda and Yugoslavia, because they were created by the Security Council, they have the enforcement powers of the Security Council. So their subpoenas, their arrest warrants, took, had the weight of the Security Council behind them. Uh, not that that always did them any good. As you can see, their success in bringing in some of their indictees that are still at large. Uh, we kind of had, for ours to be enforceable in any other country, as a legal obligation, the Security Council would have had to act on our order. But countries still had, an, an, let's say, a moral obligation, because we were an international tribunal, we were created under the Security Council to enforce our order. And Naomi Campbell's home is in London. The United Kingdom was one of the biggest supporters of our court uh, monetarily. The U.S. funded our court. The United Kingdom was number two. And I think that if we had asked the United Kingdom to enforce a subpoena in their country, they probably would have done it. It didn't come to that. It came voluntarily. Yeah. Okay, I think I had, we're probably running out of time. I think I had, did I have one more question over here? The court, uh, the court, our court, the Yugoslavia and Rwanda were set up and funded by the UN. And your country, the country's contributions to the UN paid for those courts. For most of the life of the Court of Sierra Leone, it was funded by voluntary contributions from countries wanting to see us do our work. The U.S. was the biggest contributor. The United Kingdom was number two. The Netherlands was a big one. There, Canada was a big one. Several countries that were big uh, contributors. For several years during the life of our court, the U.N. did have to fund it and give uh, a subvention grant to the U.N. to fund our court because that was a little donor fatigue might be the best way to describe it. And so the U.N. came through and ensured that we had operating funds to continue our work. Okay, yes, one more. I just wanted to ask, do you have any idea how much it costs to do that with the nine and a half years? Is there any kind of Sure, sure. And I tried not to pay attention to that. <laughs> um, I think our court was somewhere around two hundred million dollars Now we did our work in ten years for what it's costing some of those other tribunals for one year. So we were, we were. <laughs> okay, what I will do is, I've got a great, uh, I'll put on a little video here. It's about child soldiers. And uh, for those that want to watch it, I showed it at the school this morning. It's a very, very telling video about, um, about child soldiers and the impact on those soldiers. And one commander of child soldier units test, uh, talking about why he liked child soldiers and why he used child soldiers. So I will put it on here in a minute. Uh, hopefully we'll get the sound out of it. It's not hooked up to a sound system, but I'll try to put the microphone up, and so hopefully we'll work that. But we'll start that just as soon as we finish, for those that would like to see it. Let me just say this is an incredible presentation by an incredible individual under incredible circumstances. 
Uh, I am just thrilled, Jim, that you made this presentation on the 121st Robert H. Jackson birthday because it is a direct legacy of what Justice Jackson did in Warren to what you did, your services. And you must know that these are real humanitarians. The, the lawyers who commit their lives to conducting and prosecuting international humanitarian law are cut above most other lawyers. Lawyer, other lawyers, uh, ex excuse me, but uh, <laughs> sorry guys. I don't care. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. So, you know, really, it's a chip. Thank you very much because you, you noticed.